Welcome to Al TV's Israel Daily. I'm Amita Rari, and coming up in today's newscast. IDF forces fighting terror, demolishing house of IDF soldiers murderer, and eliminating terror cell in daring drone attack. Meantime, tensions soaring in Golan Heights as Druze residents clash over controversial wind farm project. And later, JNF USA Caster Joint Institute taking on global challenges of poverty, water security, and energy instability. Overnight security clashes in northern Samaria. In one incident, an IDF drone took out a terror cell about to carry out a shooting attack, and violent clashes erupted during the demolition of a terrorist home. Al TV Steve Leibovich reports. IDF soldiers entered Nablus overnight to demolish the home of Osama Tawil, one of the terrorists who murdered IDF soldier Ido Baruch. During the operation, suspects fired at the forces causing damage to military vehicles and threw explosives at Israeli troops. The soldiers responded with riot dispersal means and opened fire at armed terrorists. There were no injuries to the Israeli forces. One armed terrorist was killed in the clashes. Earlier, the IDF eliminated a terrorist cell near Jenin using a drone attack usually reserved for targeting terrorists in Gaza. A joint statement by the IDF and the Shin Bet said, that intelligence had located the terror cell in real time as it was carrying out a shooting attack near Jalma in the Menashe region. This same terror cell had recently carried out a number of shooting attacks throughout Judea and Samaria. A rapid kill order was given to prevent the cell from escaping. Security forces stepped in when Jewish vigilantes damaged property in the Palestinian village of Turmas Aya that followed funerals of victims of the Ali terrorist massacre of four Israelis. The Prime Minister demanded that citizens not take the law into their own hands. There are days when we need to say the truth. The country is a country. The Israel is a country. We are all required to defend the truth. We will not get the truth. Not in the Golan and not in the Holy Spirit. The army said it was beefing up its true presence in northern Samaria. In addition to security measures, Prime Minister Netanyahu announced the immediate plan to build 1,000 new housing units in Ailey. The message, our response to terror, is to hit hard and build in our land. And joining us now with all the latest SOAR and security updates is expert on Palestinian affairs and a senior research fellow at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, Yoni Ben Menachem. Yoni, in only the past few days, Israel used a drone to take out a terror cell and an Apache helicopter to extricate wounded soldiers from Jenin. Is the battle for northern Samaria now a battle on the ground, but also uh, in the air? Uh, what we saw, uh, the helicopter is not uh, that significant. Uh, the, what is significant is the, the drone attack. And uh, apparently Israel is changing uh, its policy uh, to deter uh, terrorism and uh, going back to the same method that was used in uh, 2006. This is the last time a drone was used in, in the West Bank. And uh, uh, I think that now the new policy will be uh, to uh, make target killings of terrorists uh, using uh, uh, drones, uh, attacks from the air. This uh, has a, a, a few purposes. Uh, one is to uh, keep the uh, uh, life of the Israeli soldiers, not to uh, risk, not to uh, uh, have them uh, endanger, endanger themselves in combat with uh, terrorism. Uh, the second uh, purpose is to improve the deterrence of uh, the Israeli army. And uh, the third uh, purpose is apparently to uh, avoid the clash with the American uh, administration, with Biden administration, which is uh, uh, putting pressure on the Israeli government not to have a large-scale operation, military operation, in the north of the uh, Judea and Samaria. And uh, in order to still uh, fight terrorism effectively, 
uh, Israel or the IDF decided to uh, go back to the method of the drones. Yoni, but if really there's so many benefits in using drones, why did I actually stop doing so? I mean, back in 2006 already, I mean, why did I stop? This is a good question. A lot of things uh, have been done in a wrong way, and uh, now it's time to correct them. Uh, but we have to take uh, into consideration that you cannot win terrorism by using drones. Uh, it is effective, uh, but on the long run, uh, in order to uproot the terror infrastructure in the north of the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, there's no other way than a large military operation. Uh, and I think it's only a matter of time until we get to this point, because uh, the way things are going, uh, uh, we're going towards a big escalation in uh, Judea and Samaria. And uh, it's not only the uh, terror organizations, it's also Iran. Uh, who is pushing uh, this terror organization and uh, uh, equip them with uh, uh, weapons and uh, money and, and uh, motivates them to continue to make terrorist attacks. So the clash is inevitable. And in the, in the long run, we will see a, a big military operation in the north of Samaria. Yanni, and uh, by your estimates, what are we looking at? How many armed terrorists are operating in Janin and Nablus and northern Samaria these days? Well, uh, I would say uh, around uh, 2,000 armed uh, terrorists. Uh, they are uh, divided to uh, between 20 to 30 uh, armed groups or militias for different organizations. This is a monster of terror which is growing from day to day. So if we will not intervene and, and stop and uh, eliminate uh, these uh, terrorists and uh, uh, dismantle the infrastructure, this monster of terrorism will grow and spread from the north of Judea and Samaria to the center and to, uh, to the south. So this is a very uh, dangerous phenomenon. Yoni ben Menachem, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Hezbollah terrorists have infiltrated Israel and set up a military post near the Lebanon border. Israel knows they're there, but is trying to use diplomacy to defuse the situation, and LTV Steve Leibovich reports. The Hezbollah move is clearly a provocation. The tiny outpost is set up along the blue line in the disputed Hardov area. It's not considered a security threat because it's not close to any Israeli residential areas and is surrounded by IDF forces. The terrorist encampment can be taken out at any moment. But it's been on Israeli land for weeks, and the IDF has chosen not to attack for the moment. The foreign ministry has been in urgent dialogue with UNIFIL to convince the small Hezbollah contingent to withdraw or else. There have been dozens of low-grade incidents over the past few years in which Hezbollah made small violations of the Blue Line border established by the UN following Israel's withdrawal from southern Lebanon in the year 2000. The government and the military appear to have decided that making the incursion into a big deal will make it harder to convince Hezbollah to leave. Violent protests flared into Golan Heights as Druze residents protested plans to build wind turbines in their villages and more in this report by RTV's William Sharon. Thousands of Druze residents of Gulan Heights took part in often rowdy protests against a planned wind farm near their villages. Protests against the new wind farm near the town of Migdal Shemesh included burning tires, hurling rocks, fireworks and Molotov cocktails as police deployed to keep the order. The protests were held in several locations and escalated into masses of people blocking roads and trying to storm the police position in the town of Masada. As part of the move toward green energy, wind power is an important component and the energy minister has marked the Golan Heights with its high altitude and windswept valleys as an optimal location for wind farms. But the plan has enraged Ruse villagers who see the project and say the giant soaring poles and the infrastructures needed to construct them drastically change their quality of life. Prime Minister Netanyahu held talks with leaders of the Druze community in Israel in an effort to calm tensions. The 
The Golan's 26,000 Druze hold Israeli residency status that gives them the right to travel and work freely in Israel. About 150,000 Druze live in Israel with full equal rights. As the world population climbs from 7 billion people today to 9.7 billion people by 2050, the number of people living in extreme poverty in vulnerable communities will increase. People in these impoverished communities face extreme challenges, including a lack of water, reduced food production, unstable energy sources, and fewer economic opportunities. These global challenges devastate rural and vulnerable communities, such as those in Africa, South America, Asia, and the developing world. To meet these challenges, Jewish National Fund USA, the University of Arizona, and the Ava Valley in Israel have formed the Castle Joint Institute for Food, Water, and Energy Security. And the mission of Castle Joint Institute is to leverage the existing knowledge and experience of the University of Arizona and the Arava to introduce innovative technology and build capacity for food, water, and energy security in vulnerable communities. The Castle Joint Institute is a center for applied research, professional training, expertise engagement, and knowledge dissemination. And joining us now in studio is Tania uh, Pons Alon, director of the Castle Joint Institute. How are you today? Great, how are you? Thank you for having okay. me. Pleasure. So how is the Arava, such a remote region in Israel, an example of such a global challenges, really? Well, that's actually a great question. I'm from the Arava. I'm a native. Um, and for those uh, who don't know where, what the Arava is or where it is, it's actually a region in the south part of Israel, in the Negev. It's hyper-arid, um, does not connect it to Israel's water grid. And essentially, it's you know has really de devastating climate and lack of water. And, um, and, you know, it's just scarcity. And what happened in uh, recent dec decades is that the Arava has become Israel's food barn, producing 50% of Israel's fresh vegetable export. That's all from 600 farms in the Arava. So when you have that knowledge and that, you know, concept in mind, you understand that the Arava has been facing desertification and all these challenges you just uh, introduced and we can actually share the knowledge. And this is why the Castor Joint Institute for Food, Water and Energy Security was formed, to take the knowledge that we've been you know, accumulating for many, many years in the farms of the Arava, combining it with the University of Arizona and doing amazing things around the world. And Tanya, really tell us some more about the research. What's so special about the agrivoltaics and aquaponics? For people who are less familiar with the terminology, what is it actually and what's so special about it? Okay. So as uh, you mentioned before, we want to target food, water, and energy insecurity. And uh, the concept we had in mind is actually creating a research that answers all three uh, issues. So the agrivoltaic is actually, um, you can hear from the, the name of it, agri as in agriculture and voltaic as in PV panels, solar uh, panels. Um, um, you actually place them on top of a field and so you can grow crops underneath them. What happens is there are many benefits for once, Plants grown in the shade are actually benefiting from the shade because you think of plants and you think about they need sunlight, that's correct. But the photosynthesis happens for several hours and then they enter in a st into stress level. So in the shade, they thrive. The second thing that happens is you don't need to use that much water because there's less evaporation. So less water, more food, uh, and the panels are actually performing better because we always think about PV panels, um, as working amazingly in you know hot places, but that's not true. They work best in sunlight, but when it's too hot, they don't perform well. So the, the plants underneath them actually cool them down, making them more efficient. And in this system, what we try to do is give small scale farmers the ability to grow food, to generate energy that they can use to operate a, so, uh, a water pump or their irrigation. And that way they can live completely off grid, which they usually are. Um, the aquaponics research is actually you know, the same concept of uh, all-in-one system. In this one, we grow fish with crops in the same uh, water tanks, uh, and you use the water over and over again. Basically, you uh, have fish in a tank, and then the water is filled with nutrients, fertilizer that uh, is irrigated uh, to crops, and then the water is circulized. So you put solar panels on top of that. Again, you're off-grid. So smart, simple solutions. Um, and what we're doing is actually research both in Arizona and the Arava, combining and sharing knowledge so that we can find the perfect solution and take it to developing countries. Wow, and we're hearing of Kenya. Why was Kenya actually chosen as the first place for implementation? Tell us shortly about the community in Kenya, about okay. this place actually. So in the Arava, we have a program called ACAT, which stands for Arava International Center for Agriculture Training. 
which brings students from developing countries to the Arava to learn about agriculture. Um, we have over 700 graduates just from Kenya. So when you ask yourself why Kenya, we, first of all, we want to reach everywhere in the world, right? But we want to start with a community where we have good relationships, where we have a network of people that we can work with. And these graduates are exactly that. They're the future of the country. So that's what, why Kenya was chosen. And uh, last July, we traveled to Kenya to meet with different communities that had great potential for a project. And we met this amazing community in Makweni, Kenya. It's a region in the south uh, of, the, of the state. Um, and what we found there was a big community with people that know to work together, which is very rare in Africa. Um, and they're eager and ready to learn and get trained. But the problem with uh, usually with projects in Africa is this sustainability, you know, for long. And our concept is not to go and, you know, deploy something and walk away. It's to train them. It's to supervise, it's to work together with the community so that the impact lasts longer. Tanya, you are JNFUSA are doing sacred work always in everything you do. Thank you so much for joining us Thank today you here. for having me. Thank you. The Ukrainian first lady in an interview on her visit to Israel condemns Putin's remarks on Jewish heritage, seeks closer ties with Israel in mental health support and early warning systems. And in a response to President Putin's remarks from a few days back, President Zelensky likens Putin to the second king of anti-Semitism after Hitler emphasizing Ukraine's resilience against Russian aggression. In a recent interview with the Jerusalem Post, Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska strongly criticized Russian President Vladimir Putin for questioning her husband's Jewish heritage. Zelenska described Putin's comments as disgraceful while expressing her disbelief that someone's ethnicity would be brought up in a political context. She also expressed hope for increased cooperation between Ukraine and Israel, particularly in terms of early warning system for airstrikes. Zelenska's visit to Israel aimed to continue a joint project with her Israeli counterpart, Michal Herzog, to provide mental health support to Ukrainians affected by the war. Zelenska visited mental health centers, met wounded Ukrainian soldiers in Israeli hospitals, and paid a visit to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Museum. She also discussed the adoption of Israeli models for community resilience centers in Ukraine. The Ukrainian First Lady highlighted the challenges faced by her country due to the ongoing war. She described her daily routine, which involves monitoring news reports to track missile strikes and expressed the difficulty of waiting for official confirmation of casualties. Zelenska emphasized the resilience and determination of the Ukrainian people, with some children attending school despite the need to take shelter during air raids. She further expressed gratitude for the aid already provided by Israel, particularly in trauma-related areas, and acknowledged the training of Ukrainian mental health specialists by Israel, hoping to implement similar emergency response programs in her country. Additionally, Zelenska sought assistance from Israel in dealing with the aftermath of the bombing of the Nova Hakova Dam, including equipment for pumping out water and experts in infectious diseases and agriculture. And regarding Putin's comments about Volodymyr Zelensky's Jewish identity, the Ukrainian president, in an interview to the BBC, likened Putin to the second king of anti-Semitism after Hitler. He acknowledged that progress in Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russian forces was slower than desired, however, emphasized that Ukraine would not be pressured into speeding up the offensive. And just like every end of the week, we're going to enjoy the story of the best wineries with ILTV's Wine of the Week. And for this week's wine pick, we're focusing on Royal Wine Europe, the corporate producing wines for many famous wineries in France. Royal Wine Corporate's mission is to be the premier manufacturer, importer, and distributor of specialty wines, spirits, and liquors from around the world. Royal's portfolio of domestic and international wines range from traditional wine-producing regions of France, Italy, and Spain to up-and-coming wines like Israel, New Zealand, and Argentina. And joining us now is CEO of Royal Wine Europe, Menachem Israelievich. Hi, Menachem. How are you doing today? I am, I am fine. Thank you. That's great. Now, Royal Wine Europe, I understand it's not wi one winery, right? I mean, as I said, it's producing for different uh, wineries around Europe. What can, more can you tell us about it? So, yeah, I'm uh, the winemaker in charge of the producing the wine in uh, several wineries in Europe. 
and especially in France, there are all wineries that they are not uh, kosher, but we, we produce only a small, small batch of kosher wine. So my work is, uh, uh, first of all, to, to try to convince them to agree to do uh, uh, kosher wine in their winery because they are great wineries, very well known in all the world. They are from the top wineries in the world. And then we have to, to work with them all during the year to help them to make the, their wine, but to be kosher. It's a big question. What more can you tell us about the process? I mean, how do you convince wineries to take your kosher wines? And also a bit more about the process. I mean, how does it work to actually create, to produce a kosher wine? <coughs> so, uh, you know, for, for, for a wine to be kosher, we have to, 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 to do that. All the operation, everything that we have to, we have to do in the winery has to be done through a, a wine uh, worker that is, uh, is observant, is Shomer Shabbat. So that's why we have my work all during the year is to work with the winemaker of the winery to organize everything, all the, the cellar work, <coughs> to be done by our team. So I have a, I have, I have a total, I have a crew of uh, between 10 and 50 uh, people, depend on uh, the, the period of the year to be able to work with each winery and to do all the work that they do for the non-kosher wine, we have to do the for same the work exactly wine. for the kosher wine. That's nice. Now, what did you bring us here today? I mean, I see different wines. I assume they're like, I see rosé, I see, I assume red and, and, and white. I mean, what do you have here today? What so did you bring us? Here today, uh, I brew a small uh, a s example of what we do in France. As you, do, you know, in France, what it's very important we are not talking about the, the, the varietal, not, not so much about the grapes. And that's why you can see in, in all the French uh, bottles, you never have on the front, uh, front label, you, don't, you never have the, the name of the, the, the varietal, of the grape. Because what is very important is the, what we call the appellation. It's the area, the region from where come the, wow. the, 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 the grapes. So how we have three of, of the top winery in Bordeaux, Chateau Lascombe, it's an Amargo appellation, of course, because it's coming from Bordeaux, so it's a blend of Cabernet, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. This one also comes from Bordeaux uh, area, but it's the appellation of Pessac Léonien, so it's Chateau Malartic La Gravière, and also a very good wine from Listrac Médoc, it's Chateau Focas du Pont. And then for the Rosé, we have a very <coughs> huge winery that it's a Cru Classé, what we call the Cru Classé in Provence. As you know, Provence, it's the the, the place of the rosé. Uh, so this is the Chateau Rubin, Chateau Rubin Cru Classé. It's a blend of seven different grapes from Provence. Why seven actually? Why do you need seven to, to produce Because wine? Because we have so many different terroirs, different soil in Provence. And of course, the main uh, grapes, they are uh, uh, Grenache, Syrah and Sanso. But we have also other uh, grapes that we use like uh, Mourvedre, like uh, Roll, other grapes that they are used also in Provence because the terroir is good for those uh, varietals. What's your top favorite? I know it's a difficult question because they're all your, your children, exactly. as we may say, but what's your top favorite? Uh, let's say that uh, today, uh, for this season, I will drink more uh, rosé wine, okay? But uh, those kind of wine, they are to keep in the cellar for, because they have a big potential of aging for 20, 25 years, sometime more. I just opened last uh, week uh, uh, a wine from Bordeaux that it was uh, from 2003. So 20 years and it's still almost young. So those are more to sell out and to to keep for the for the wedding of your children or for That's the amazing. Mitzvah. They're always a classic. Menachem, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for joining us today. Merci de m'avoir invité. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies are expected throughout the country tonight with lows of around 19 degrees Celsius or 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Tomorrow, partly cloudy skies are expected to continue alongside steady temperatures that are set to last throughout the weekend, reaching highs of around 31 degrees Celsius or 89 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our RTV channel, subscribe to our RTV newsletter, and of course, do not forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.TV, with all of the latest news from the heart of the State of Israel. I'm Amit Harari. Have an amazing weekend, and thank you so much for watching.